members meeting November the 8th and if you're interested in being a member of Grace Bible Church you would need to write out your testimony for me uh, you would need to have a look at the church covenant and see if you would be willing to live by that you would also need to have had a believer's baptism and you would need to go to our website gracebible.online and have a look at the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith and see if you agree with that doctrine Vincent will you read a call to worship sir Good morning. Good morning. It's got to love the chorus of kids. You know, one starts and then it just kind of goes all over the place. <laughs> uh, uh, Brent asked me to read Psalm 99, 1 through 5. Let's begin. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king, in his might, loves justice. You have established equity. You have ex executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for the cold weather. Thank you for the change of season, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray this morning that uh, that we understand that you are uh, holy, that you reign over each one of us, Lord, and that you reign over the entire world, Lord. Lord, I pray for Brent this morning, that you would fill him with the Holy Spirit, and that your words would be just glorifying to each one of us, Lord, and that you would soften our hearts so that we could take in uh, your message, Lord, and I pray that... Uh, as we walk out of these doors, that we're able to uh, live them out and continue to do your will as you see fit. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's stand and sing.
Christ means to read the church covenant. This is Grace Bible Church covenant. As we trust, we have been brought by divine grace to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and by the influence of His Holy Spirit to give ourselves up to Him so we do most solemnly covenant with each other that God, enabling us, we will walk together in brotherly love. That we will exercise a Christian care and watchfulness over each other and faithfully warn, rebuke, and admonish one another as the case shall require. And in all things, we will seek and guard the honor and the true function of the church. That we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, nor omit the great duty of prayer, both for ourselves together and for others, and for the enterprises of the kingdom, the enterprises of the kingdom of God. That we will share each other's joys and endeavors with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows. That we will seek divine aid to enable us to walk circumspectly and watchfully in the world, denying ungodliness and every worldly lust. That we will endeavor by example and effort to win souls of Christ and through life amidst evil report and good report seek to live to the glory of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous life. Amen. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for thank you for salvation. Thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. We have sinned against you in action, word, deed, thought, Lord. And yet your grace and mercy is still bestowed upon us, Lord. And you have called us children of yours, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for this church. We thank you that uh, you have laid out clear in Scripture uh, what you expect out of your church, Lord. And through this covenant, God, I pray that, uh, that, that people sign it, people who know it, that, Lord, we keep coming back to it so we realize the covenant that we have with you. Lord, and that this church has with you, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for all that you will do. And I pray that this service, whatever it is, whatever is taught, whatever is sung, whatever is prayed, Lord, whatever is preached, will bring you uh, glory. That all that is done today will change the hearts and minds of your people so that we can be about building a kingdom as you see fit. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Come in here, okay? <laughs> Let's stay in
anyhow, God is glorified in it, nevertheless.
Let's pray. Father, we're glad to be here today that you've given us life and breath and a desire to come and worship with your people. We thank you, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you are the triune God, holy beyond our imagination, perfect in every way, that you are light and in you is no darkness at all. Uh, Father, we are not as you are. We are weak. We are needy. We are fallen. Uh, we are nothing but dust apart from your grace and mercy. And I pray, Lord, that you would minister to us now through the scriptures. I pray that you would take uh, my weak preaching and make it strong in my life and in the lives of those who hear. We ask that you would come, Holy Spirit, and use your word to transform the way that we look at ourselves, the world we live in, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, we ask, Lord, that we would have right understandings of things like sin and righteousness and judgment. And I pray, Father, that you would uh, just enable me to speak as one speaking the very words of God. Uh, you know that uh, my mind is muddled and oftentimes my heart is not where it needs to be and my priorities are sometimes out of line, most times out of line. And Lord, I'm just a sinner and I need you in every way. I can do nothing apart from you. Uh, I cannot preach apart from you. I can't get the next breath apart from you. So help me to preach in a way that pleases the Lord Jesus Christ. And by your grace, may my preaching be a demonstration of the Spirit and power. Now, Lord, enable us to hear. Enable our minds to focus on what's being said and not to drift off to, to tomorrow or next year or next month or what we might want to eat for lunch after church. Lord, help us to profit from what's being said. And Lord, I just pray that you would make me a better man than I am, make us better people than we are. Uh, make this sermon better than what it is even now. And continue to grow your church. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Hopefully you found your way to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read verse 14, 15, and 16. 1 Timothy 3, 14, Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon. But I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up, in glory. So this morning in our journey through 1 Timothy, we arrive at a little chunk of Scripture that's very central to the whole book of 1 Timothy. A verse where Paul tells us his overarching purpose in writing everything that has come before and everything that will come after. Verse 15, you see it there. The purpose is this, so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. That's what we've been talking about all through chapter 2 and chapter 3, and that's what he's going to continue to talk about in chapters 4 and 5, behavior in the household of God. So the purpose of this epistle was to correct the sinful behavior of the Ephesian church. Do you remember some of the sinful behavior that we've been talking about for the past couple of months? There were anger problems in the church even during prayer. Do you remember that? The, uh, he said, I want the men to lift holy hands without anger or quarreling. He said that back in chapter 2. The women were dressing immodestly in the church, and they were assuming leadership roles that were reserved for men. Uh, elders were teaching myths, genealogies, speculations instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of the deacons and elders had children and families that were out of control. And lives that were characterized by sexual immorality, drunkenness, and greed. All these things and more were going on in the church of Ephesus. And in the chapters to come, Paul's going to go on. He's going to tell us how to reject false doctrine. Uh, he's going to tell us what to do when we gather for worship. He's going to tell us how we ought to treat widows and how to decide who truly is a widow, etc., etc., etc. So Paul wrote 1 Timothy so that we would know how to behave in such a way that we can be used by God as a church to grow his kingdom in this world. So the little short question that we want to answer from our text today is this. What is a church? What is a church? Three answers in the text, two short ones and one long one, okay? What is a church? First, it is the household of God. Do you see this in verse 15? He reminds the Ephesian church of who they are. He says, that you may know 
how one ought to behave in the household of God. So scripture often refers to Christian people as God's house, as God's family. For example, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says this, uh, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? As Christian people, we are God's house. Or think about Ephesians 2.19, which refers to Christian people as God's family. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So the false teaching and the sinful behavior in the Ephesian church was not just damaging some social organization like the Rotary Club or the Moose Lodge. It was damaging the household of God, the family of God. It was bringing shame on God's house and on his name and on Christ and on his gospel. God is the one who has the authority in his household, the one who has authority over his family. As the head of his household, God is the one who makes the rules and decides how we, his family, Christian people, must behave. For example, uh, when you go to visit another person's house, do you go into their house and tell them that their furniture is arranged in a wrong way? Do you tell them that some of the plants in the landscaping need to be taken up and others uh, placed there? Do you tell them what to cook for supper? Do you tell them what bed to lie down in and go to sleep? Well, of course not. And in the same way, you and I don't decide what goes in God's household, in God's family. Wouldn't that be transformative just to understand that one thing for the American church? We don't have the authority to say what goes on in God's household. God does. We're his family. He's over his household. We don't decide what we should believe or not believe, what we should preach or not preach. Uh, we don't dream up ways to worship God that suit our own personal tastes. We're God's household, so we must do things God's way. We must teach what the scriptures teach. We must live according to the dictates of the word of God because God is the head of his household, the head of his family. He's the one who has the authority to determine the faith and the practice of us, his people. Uh, this is why the reformers taught the principle of sola scriptura. Sola scriptura. They taught that all of life is to be regulated by scripture alone. In other words, God's word dictates how we worship God, what we teach, and how we behave as Christian people. So let me ask this question uh, of those who are here this morning. Are you concerned with how God wants you to behave as a Christian? Is that a concern of yours? Are you concerned to bring your entire life under the authority of Scripture? Are you seeking to bring all of your behavior, both inside the walls of this church and outside the walls of this church, into conformity with the revealed will of God through the Holy Scriptures? Are you concerned to be a member in good standing of a church that teaches the whole counsel of God's Word? Is that a concern of yours this morning? Are you concerned to be a part of a church that does not worship God based on the latest evangelical fad, but... By the reading of scripture, the preaching of the word of God, the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs through baptism and through the Lord's Supper. Are you concerned to live like a member of God's household, God's family? Are you and I concerned to bear the family likeness? Well, what is a church? The first short answer was this. It's the household of God. We have another short answer here, number two. It is the church of the living God, the church of the living God. Do you see that? In verse 14 and 15, I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to. Uh, the word ought to is probably better translated must. So that you may know how one must behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. So Christian people in local churches are the church of the living God. In other words, Jesus Christ is not a dead idol. He's not a fake deity. He is the living God. God. The godly behavior that Paul is calling for, it's not optional. It's urgent because we represent the living God as Christian people. The idea of God being a living God is that unlike a dead idol, he lives among his people. You ever thought about that as a Christian, that God dwells in me by his spirit. And as a church, he lives among us. 
And in the Old Testament, this was such a prominent idea in the minds of Jewish people that God was a living God who lived among his people, that it had bearing on even the earthiest details of their lives. For example, how they built their latrines was based on the fact that God was a living God who dwelt among his people. Listen to Deuteronomy 23, verse 12 through 14. It says, you shall have a place outside the camp and you shall go out to it. And you shall have a trowel with your tools. And when, and when you sit down outside, you shall dig a hole with it and turn back and cover up your excrement. Because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp. They were so aware that God was among them, the living God, that even the way they went to the bathroom was based on the fact that God is a living God who dwelt among them. Because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be what? Holy. Your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. So Paul tells the Ephesian church that they are the church of the living God because he wants them and us to remember that all our behavior is carried out in the presence of a living and holy God every day of our lives. Wouldn't it do us a world of good to think about that uh, when we're by ourselves somewhere and we're like, I think it's time for me to indulge in a little sin. Guess what? God's right there in the room with you. That would put a stop to a whole lot of it, would it not? I serve the living God. He dwells in me and with me. Paul also refers to Christian people as the church of the living God because it's a reminder that the living God will take action against anybody who claims his name and yet goes on living in a way that dishonors him. Listen to Hebrews 10.31, which calls this to our attention. Hebrews 10, 31 says, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the what? The living God. So Jesus Christ is not some dead idol who can do nothing. Our behavior matters because God lives, and he can and will act to discipline and even to judge those who continually make a mockery of his holy name. How does God do this? Well, most of the time, I have noticed that God disciplines and even judges those who live lives that mock his holy name by doing this. He just withers them slowly over the course of 10, 20, 30 years, and he gives them over to their sin until there's nothing left of them. But he is also able to act in a more decisive way to set things straight. Uh, if you'll remember in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, God acted the living God acted to discipline two men who ignored what God said about how he ought to be worshipped, Nadab and Abihu. Uh, they were priests in the tabernacle of God, and God said, this is how I want to be worshipped. And one day they got the idea, well, we'll just worship you any way we want. We'll change things up a little bit. And so Leviticus 10, 1 through 3 says this, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord. So they did something funky with the incense that they weren't supposed to do, that God said not to do. Uh, it was unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. So God took action against the willful, high-handed disobedience of Nadab and Abihu. Because he's a living God who is able to act. He's not a dead idol that we can mock and ignore and get away with it. So if you think uh, that you can call yourself a Christian and willfully pursue some kind of sin year after year, decade after decade, and that God will be mocked and that you can get away with that, you are thinking wrongly. He will discipline you if you're a Christian. And if you're a nominal Christian, a Christian in name only, he will judge you. He is the living God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, brothers and sisters, do we live our lives like God is alive and among us in every detail of our lives, both public and private? Or do we live like God is a dead idol who cannot act, who can do nothing, a dead idol that we can mock by rejecting his commands, making up our own rules, and living life in any old way that we please any time we want? If there's one thing the modern church lacks, it is reverence for God. 
the modern church is a church that is bereft of the fear of the Lord. Uh, we are so flippant, and we are so shallow, and we are so self-centered. Does it ever cross our minds that we have identified ourselves with the living God who is all holy, almighty, and always present? Do we live our lives like we belong to the living God? It's amazing how focused this epistle of 1 Timothy is on the conduct, on the behavior of Christian people. I was talking to Michael before service. I'm like, this message is about the conduct of Christian people. Again, like 1 Timothy is focusing in on our behavior as Christian people like a laser. It's amazing how, how tight the focus is on Christian behavior. Verse 14 and 15 again. I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to or must behave. It's about our behavior as Christian people, how we ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And this focus on behavior reminds us that true Christianity is more than mere head knowledge, more than dead orthodoxy. Real Christianity is very practical. It's meant to affect every facet of our daily lives in real and tangible ways. Doctrine and practice cannot be separated. Which one's more important? Yes. They're both important. Doctrine and practice. So, what is a church? First short answer, it is the household of God. Second short answer, it is the church of the living God. And thirdly, and this is a longer answer, it is a proclaimer and protector of the truth. The church is a proclaimer and protector of the truth. Do you see this in verse 15? The church of the living God, a pillar and and buttress of the truth. Maybe you've got a translation that says a bulwark of the truth. Maybe you've got a translation that says a ground of the truth. So uh, the Ephesian church was failing. They were behaving so poorly that their sin was destroying the reputation of the church in the eyes of a watching world. Their behavior was eroding the integrity of the truth of the gospel that they were there to protect and proclaim. So Paul reminds them, and he reminds us, that nothing less than the truth of the gospel itself is at stake in the way that we live our lives as Christian people. That's a scary thought, isn't it? You know, my life is not the gospel, and my life is not the truth. But nonetheless, my behavior has a real impact on whether or not others hear and believe the truth, hear and believe the gospel. That's a scary thought, is it not? As Christian people, we're called to make the truth known to the world around us. This is what Paul is getting at when he calls the church a pillar of the truth. So the city of Ephesus was the home of one of the uh, wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Diana or Artemis. It had a hundred marble columns that stretched up 60 feet into the air, and it held this uh, large gleaming marble roof up for all the world to see. You could see it from miles away. And those pillars held up that palace for all to see. In the same way, the church is called to hold the truth of Jesus Christ high for all to see. We're called to proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That, that's what it means to be a pillar of the truth. We're called to make the truth of the gospel known to a world that is drowning in a sea of lies. Not only are we called to hold up or proclaim the truth, we're called to protect the truth. Do you see that in verse 15? That's what Paul's getting at when he calls the church a buttress or a bulwark of the truth. And so the idea here is that the church is called to defend the true gospel against the storms of heresy and false doctrine and unbelief. The church depends on the truth of the gospel for its existence, and the truth depends on the church for its protection and preservation. Think about a few verses that tell us this, like 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Making a defense for the hope that we have in Christ is part of what it means to be a bulwark or a buttress of the truth. We defend the truth. Or think about Jude, the epistle of Jude, verse 3 and 4. Beloved, I, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to do what? 
to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So as a buttress of the truth, we're called to contend for the faith. Or think about Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. <coughs> says that an elder or a pastor must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. A pastor has to be a man who protects the truth of the gospel. Uh, Martin Luther said this, the church is always one generation from losing the gospel. Is that not true? And Martin Luther knew that from experience because he grew up in a generation that had lost the gospel. And that's why it's so important that we live godly lives that enable us to proclaim and to protect the truth. In so doing, we're following in the footsteps of Jesus himself who was very much about the truth. Listen to what Jesus said about himself as he was being queried by Pontius Pilate. John 18, 37 to 38. <coughs> then Pilate said to Jesus, So you're a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. To do what? To bear witness to the truth. Jesus said, I came down from heaven to bear witness to the truth. I came down from heaven to be a pillar and buttress of the truth, so to speak. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? Pilate was the first postmodern. What is truth? Is that not the cry of our culture? What is truth? We live in a culture that rejects the idea of absolute truth altogether. Truth has become whatever we make it based on whichever way the wind happens to be blowing at any given time. Uh, in our digital culture, we are so bombarded incessantly with media and with images that nobody can separate fiction from reality anymore. Nobody can separate the real world from the fake world. Nobody can separate truth from lies. Philosophers call this hyper-reality. Hyper-reality because it, it blurs the lines between what is real and what is simulated. We as a culture are relentlessly bombarded from every direction with, with fake news and fake images and fake narratives and even fake people on screens. This comes at us from every direction to the point where our culture has basically given up not only on finding the truth, but they've given up on the very concept of truth itself as something that does not exist, as something that is not knowable. But Christian people are called to be promoters and protectors of the truth of the gospel as found in Scripture. Are you and I growing in our knowledge of the Word of God and our ability to defend it? Are we able to have a conversation with our neighbor about what happens after death and graciously explain to him that his views about reincarnation are not true and that what I'm telling you about Jesus Christ is true and here's why it is true. Are you able to have a conversation like that? We're to be a pillar and a buttress of the truth. Can we communicate and defend the truth that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, the Son of God, and that no man comes to the Father except by Him, and that this is not just my opinion? And here's why this is not just my opinion. Here are the things that happened in the course of human history. Uh, we have eyewitnesses who saw these things and wrote them down. This is not whichever way the wind's blowing. This is not my opinion versus yours. This is the truth. We're called to be a protector and a defender of the truth as Christian people and as a church. So let me ask you this morning, are you interested in the truth? Are you interested in the truth? Most professing Christians are not interested in the truth these days. They're interested in a church that makes them feel comfortable, a church that can entertain their kids. I know so many people that go to silly, sappy, soft churches because they have a bunch of things for their kids to do. So what? Your kids need to know the truth, and so do you. Get in a church that teaches the truth, for heaven's sake. Most professing Christians are interested in a church that has all the programs and all the amenities, a church that is flashy and popular and trendy, 
but not a church that teaches the truth of God's Word in a forthright, unapologetic way. Do you want to have enemies as a Christian person? Then stand on the truth in a forthright, unapologetic way, and the people who will hate you above all are professing Christians. I know this from experience. If you stand on the Word and say, this is what it says, plain and simple, there will be Christians coming out of every corner loathing and despising you because most people who identify as Christians these days have no use for the truth. Saved people love the truth. Do you hear what I said? Saved people love the truth. If you don't love and pursue the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth of the rightly divided Word of God, then rest assured that you are a Christian in name only. Do you love the truth of God as revealed in His Word, even when it goes against your preconceived notions? If you do, it's a sign that the Spirit of truth lives in you and that you're born again. Are you seeking to grow in your knowledge of the truth of God's Word and your personal knowledge of Him who is the truth, Jesus Christ? Do you and I display the effects of the truth in our life? Godliness. As Christian people, we're called to hear the truth, study the truth, memorize the truth, live the truth, uh, to disseminate the truth. The church is an island of truth in a sea of lies and false narratives and false religions and empty promises. The church is a pillar and buttress of the truth, a proclaimer and a protector of the truth about Jesus Christ as delivered to us by his apostles on the pages of Holy Scripture. Now at Grace Bible Church, uh, we are not motivated to do things that work. We don't care whether it works. We care that it's true. We're not pragmatists. We care about the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth of His Word. We're not back there giving away iPads to sucker people in here. We care about the truth. The heart of every ministry of the church is to get the truth into people who are drowning in lies and in error both inside the church and outside the walls of the church. Why? Because the truth matters. Because when people believe lies about ultimate reality, it guarantees the fact that they're going to die in their sins, be judged by a holy God, and spend an eternity in hell forever. The truth matters. Finally, Paul gives us a sample of the great truths that we're called to proclaim and defend by quoting a few lines from an ancient hymn. So if you'll look at uh, the latter part of verse 16, you'll notice in most of your Bibles, it's offset from the rest of the text. And that's a way that the authors and editors of the, of the Bible are telling you this is a line or a stanza from an ancient hymn or an ancient creed. And he introduces this ancient hymn in verse 16 with this line, which is a bit strange. He says, Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. So one of the main terms that Paul uses in the pastoral epistles to identify the gospel is the term Godliness. The mystery of godliness is the mystery of the gospel that was hidden for long ages, but it's now been revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has been revealed as the one who produces godliness in those who trust in Him. The ancient hymn that Paul quotes deals with some of these great truths that the church is called to proclaim and protect. Truths about the mystery of godliness. Uh, one of the mysterious things about godliness is that godliness begins outside of us. It began in the womb of a virgin in Palestine 2,000 years ago. Look at verse 16. First line is this, He was manifested in the flesh. This refers to the incarnation. The eternal Word, the second person of the Trinity, took on flesh and united His deity to the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ in the womb of a virgin 2,000 years ago in Palestine. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1.1 1, 1 says this. John 1.1-2 1, 1 and verse 14 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
So how do we know that Christianity is true? Because the eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us. Because we have the eyewitness testimony of men who ate with the eternal word, Jesus Christ. And they talked with him and they lived with him and they put their hands on him. Listen to what John says about this in the epistle of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. John says, I have touched the Lord Jesus Christ. I have touched the God man. I have touched the word who became flesh. Christianity is not some fairy tale. Jesus was fully God and fully man, and he lived among men who touched him with their own hands. That's why the Bible's teaching is true. It's based on eyewitness testimony to historical facts that happened in real time and real space. Why did the eternal word take on flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth? To live the life that you and I could not live, a perfect life for 33 years. To die the death that we deserve, church, in our place. To bear the wrath of God for us and to rise from the dead for our justification. To reconcile us to the Father so that we can live with Him forever in a new heaven and a new earth. He was manifested in the flesh. And then there in verse 16 we see another line. He was vindicated by the Spirit. So this is a reference to the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. Uh, the resurrection vindicated everything that Jesus said about himself. All of his teaching, all of his claims. And the one claim that was the most audacious was this claim. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. The resurrection vindicated Jesus as the Son of God. Listen to Matthew 26, verse 63 to 65. And the high priest said to Jesus... I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? What was the blasphemy? He said, I'm the Son of God. Literally, he said, I'm the Son of Man. And that meant, I'm the guy Daniel's preaching about in Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man who receives a kingdom and power and authority from the Ancient of Days. He said, I'm the Son of God. The high priest said, this is blasphemy. But the bodily resurrection of Jesus after three days in the grave vindicated his claim to be the Son of God or the Son of Man from Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Paul calls our attention to the vindicative aspect of the resurrection in Romans 1.4. Romans 1.4, Paul says, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness. How? By His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is why the Christian faith is historically, verifiably true. It does not appeal to myths. It appeals to undeniable historical facts like the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it relies on eyewitness testimony of those events, eyewitnesses who gave their lives for the truth of this testimony. Look at verse 16 again. Here's a little phrase. Uh, people argue about what this means. It says, seen by angels. Seen by angels. This is a reference to Christ being displayed in victory before heavenly beings. 1 Peter 3.22 talks about this. It says that the resurrected Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels. Angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Ephesians 1, 20 to 21 says much the same thing. It says that the Father seated Christ at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. In other words, above all heavenly and supernatural beings. So the risen Christ is victorious over all supernatural powers, over the angelic realm, the demonic realm, the satanic realm, over every realm. He is victorious. That's what it means, seen by angels. 
So the first stanza of this hymn lays out the truth that the church is to proclaim and protect. The truth of Jesus' incarnation and his death and his resurrection and his victory over supernatural powers. Now the second stanza basically shows some of the results of Christ's work. You see that in verse 16? It says, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world. That's not too hard to figure out, is it? Christ lived, died, and rose again. He was preached and believed on among the nations. As a pillar and buttress of the truth, the church is to preach the gospel of Christ so that people can come to faith. And as a result, Christ will receive the glory that he deserves. And one of the things that Paul's getting at, he's trying to tell the Ephesian church, unless you guys stop with this sinful behavior, the gospel will not be preached and Christ will not be believed in and he will not receive the glory due his name. And then we get to this final little phrase of the hymn there at the end of verse 16. It says, taken up in glory. Uh, this is a reference to the ascension. After Christ rose from the dead, he went back up into heaven after appearing to his disciples for a period of 40 days. Acts 1, 9 to 11 records this event. And when he had said these things, he being Jesus, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, that would be angels, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So uh, one of the things you're probably thinking right now is this is out of chronological order, <laughs> the, the events in this creed. Yes, they are. Uh, whoever wrote this hymn, this creed, they're not concerned with chronology. Uh, they're kind of concerned with the humiliation, exaltation motif. That's why the first line is humiliation. He took on flesh. The last line is he was taken up into glory. So chronology is not the concern of whoever wrote this hymn. Uh, the, the hymn starts low with the incarnation. It ends high with the ascension and glorification of Christ. But in Acts, the angels say this, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, the same way you saw Jesus go up into glory, he's going to come back in glory one day. Are you ready for that day when Jesus returns? It could be today. It could be 500 years from now. I do not know. But whether he comes during your lifetime or not, one thing is for sure. You're going to die and go to stand before him. And he's going to evaluate your life. And he's going to be looking for proof that you trusted in Christ. He's not going to be judging you by your works, but your works will demonstrate. There will be the evidence of whether you had saving faith in the Lord Jesus. Do you believe these truths in this ancient hymn? Do you believe that the eternal word took on flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth? Do you believe that he bled and died in your place to bear the wrath of God for your sin this morning? Do you believe that Jesus rose bodily from the dead after three days and that when he rose, you rose with him? Do you believe that today Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and that you are seated there with him through your faith union in Jesus Christ in the heavenly places? Have you received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Are you growing in godliness as a member of the household of God, the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth? Today is the day when anyone here who is not ready for the return of Christ can trust in the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, can receive Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. You can be saved. You can be ready if he were to come back today. Or you can be ready if you were to get out there on the interstate after this service and be in a head-on car crash, you can be ready. And the choice is up to you. And he invites whosoever will to come. And he promises, if you'll come to, him, come to me, Jesus says, I will never turn you away. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these ancient truths. We thank you that we have a little synopsis of the gospel here in this ancient hymn from a book of the Bible that was written uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 A.D. And that these things are not legendary accretions or myths, but they are given to us by people who actually touched the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived with him, who ate with him, who heard his teaching firsthand, and who not only touched him before his death, but touched him after his death 
after he had risen from the grave. They laid their hands on him. And Lord, we are living in a world, in an age that is bombarded with fake everything. Nobody knows truth from error anymore. Uh, people have given up on the truth altogether. Help us to know that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that no man comes to the Father but by him. Help us to believe, Lord, uh, those here who are dead in sin and transgression and unbelief. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give them a heart of flesh. Uh, we pray, Lord, for your church. Increase our faith in the truth of the gospel. And help us to live in such a way that our lives do not erode our witness before the watching world. Help us to live in such fellowship with you and such godly lives that we have the power to testify to these truths uh, in, in the presence of those we work with and strangers and family and friends. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to play a couple verses. You go to the Lord in prayer and prepare your heart to take communion. as always that the Lord's table is for baptized believers in Christ. If you've trusted in Christ to take away the guilt of your sin, if you have received him as Lord and been baptized, this meal is for you. If not, wait until you have repented, believed, and been baptized, and then you may partake. Also, the Lord's table is for saved sinners. Every Christian is a saved sinner. We say this every week. I'm going to say it again. If you're living in some kind of hardened, unrepentant sin, make that right with the Lord before you partake of this meal. When you're ready, you may come.
The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing, O Church, Arise.
That would be the secret of God in us. The power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You're at liberty to go.